Generic greetings and welcome back to Science Insanity, our lovely podcast show thing where we bring my love of science fiction in all its wondrous, glorious insanity to you, and where we have Steve, our wonderful tag-along, playing the role of the science illiterate as we have him as a stand-in for the general community, teaching him all the ins and outs of turbo nerd culture. Say hello, Steve. Hello. The classic intro. Thank you for your deadbeat hello. Hey, man, you only asked me to say hello, so, I mean... Ugh, one, one day, we should, one day we should randomly have you do some ridiculous intro or something just to throw people off, and it's only gonna happen once, then never again, for no, for <laughs> no, ex again. <laughs> for no explainable reason. Today, we are going to be covering the formation of the Star League and the Unification War. This is part one, all of the wonderful politicking in the Age of War beforehand that led up to the formation of the Star League, as well as the wonderful strong arming and outright lies that went into making this thing work, and the absolute insane reality of the Capellans actually being honorable and following through with something that they said they were going to do, rather than shanking you in the kidneys when you turn around. The Capellans are doing something not dickish. Man, the Capellan fans are, must absolutely despise us. Doesn't matter what we do, even when we do the Capellan episode, we're probably still gonna absolutely shit on that entire faction and all of its fans. Don't worry, they'll get over it at some point. Yeah, or it's, not. I mean... <laughs> who cares? It's what they signed up for, they knew what they were getting into when they picked the worst faction. Before we get into anything else, we need to start by talking about the Star League and why it is so damn important. Because a lot of people just get into explaining it and the events that happened, and they don't really explain why it is the literal center point of the entire Battletech universe of which all other events either lead into or spiral out from. The Star League is basically everything. You can directly trace the roots of pretty much every faction that propped up after it directly to its formation. You can trace all of the political intrigue and everything that happened before directly to its formation. And during the Star League, everything that possibly could go wrong and right happened at the same time. So, for example, the current great houses in the map in the far future, that's all because of the Star League, baby. The Terran hegemony got eaten by the great houses and we got our lovely pie-shaped empires. We also have the periphery regions. You don't know what those are, Steve, but other people do. The, the periphery nations and empires and stuff. They basically only exist because of the prior Age of War, and afterwards they only exist in their current form because of the Star League. Comstar, the clans, the Blakist Jihad, you don't know about that either, Steve. Don't worry about it, it's fine. They only exist because of the Star League, so this empire caused so many things to happen, and without it, massive chunks of the Battletech universe simply wouldn't exist. It is the bedrock by which this entire IP is basically built on. Hey, I know about Comcast. I mean... At least I know one of those things. I mean, you know about the clans as well. We did like what three, four episodes on the clans. Something yeah, like that. I was, I was, I, those were a given that I knew about. Yeah, come on, though. No. You you gotta remember the clans, right? Soup stock, smooth brain, piped in the head, clan honorable. Come on, we you know what these buzzwords just, just mean. Give it, just, just give it as an excuse to go back to the soup stock. <laughs> We can't let it die. That's a meme now. It has to continue. I won't let it die, no matter how much we beat the dead horse with it. So let's start with what stuff was like before the Star League. It was generally known as the Age of War, and I'll give you three guesses about what happened during it. Uh, was there, like, war or something? I don't know. No, it was nothing but peace and prosperity. Yeah, it was never-ending war between literally everyone. If we go back far enough to just after the Great Houses were formed, you're basically looking at the entirety of human space tearing itself apart as small micro-empires pop up, pirate kingdoms emerge, and everything gets swept under the rug as the Great Houses begin their steamroller of conquest across the stars. It was arguably several hundred years of non-stop violence on almost every world that humans touch down on for one reason or another. Whether it be territorial disputes, whether it be wars of independence from the existing powers, it was pretty much non-stop fighting and there was almost nobody that was immune to it. The only places that were reasonably sheltered were the Terran hegemony. 
because they were pretty much the center of human space, they had closed their borders long before, secured their space, and were generally left mostly unmolested by this amount of violence, although their outer borders were taking one hell of a kicking because of all of this kicking off as well. This persisted, like I said, for hundreds of years, and with the advent of the battle mech, it only got worse. However, the battle mech is not what the deciding factor of the Age of War was, despite what history and what the future would claim about it. The deciding factor and the most notable thing was, of course, that oh, so wonderful of weapons that ended World War II with quite the flash, the good old atomic weapon, because dropping the sun on your fellow man will never not be a funny way to T-pose on your enemy and claim absolute victory. Good old classic. It's, it is simply the classic. If there's nothing but ash left to oppose you, are you truly opposed? Yeah, it was not good. And keep in mind, this era in humanity was pretty much categorized by rampant industrialism and petty warlords. Every world that was settled had to be basically self-sufficient at this point because interstellar trade and travel was unreliable or outright non-existent at the best of times. So, all of these random nothing planets had the capability of manufacturing nuclear weapons, and nuclear war was unbelievably prolific. Worlds would very frequently be reduced to borderline, almost uninhabitable wastelands. Outposts that were showing resistance would just get a nuke rather than anything else at the drop of a hat, and violence was the immediate reaction to almost anything, regardless how small the slight was, because it was simply so easy to exert such force across human space, and there was no repercussions, because when you got hundreds of planets, who cares if you render, like, 50 of them uninhabitable? You got 50 more, whatever, it's fine. This, however had to come to an end, because it is unsustainable to just throw nukes like someone fires bullets. It just, it just can't happen, both for economic reasons and for, man, I really don't want to be any more tanned than I already am, thank you very much, kind of reasons. The Ares Conventions were signed by all the great houses in an effort to end the insane proliferation of this war and try to rein in its absolute destructive potential. And what kicked this off was the world of Tintavel. Since the Free Worlds League and the Capellan Confederation were fighting for months and pretty much years at this point over this world, the brutality had gradually escalated to frankly insane levels. Originally, they tried to fight the war normally. They attempted to simply send in their forces, blow each other up, avoid civilian areas. However, you're fighting the Capellans. That's never how things are going to go with them. Fighting the war responsibly and without war crimes, it just... It's like asking someone not to breathe. They can't do it. They're going to give up after 30 seconds, go red in the face, and then immediately call you an idiot for asking them to try. So of course, the Capellans started using hit-and-run tactics, hiding within cities, and camouflaging themselves as part of the civilian populace, because honor is for fools and winning is all that matters in the great game. At least that much I can understand, if not really respect. Once the civilian population had thinned out a little bit and the constant attritional warfare had destroyed most of the valuable infrastructure on the world, the two commanders basically gave up any shred of dignity in this fight. When a city or an area with still tons of civilians in it showed strong military resistance, they would simply wipe that city off the face of the planet. There was no warning, there was no opportunity for them to get away, the air raid sirens were, would go once the missiles tripped the alarms, and then moments later the city would cease to exist. Eventually, the world was so drastically damaged that both sides literally just gave up. The Free Worlds League and the Capellan Confederation both agreed to cease the fighting, and over time they both simply pulled all of their forces off, leading to this planet being eventually fully abandoned, and if I remember correctly, even in the modern day, like 500, 600 years later, there's still nobody living on this world. It was reduced to nothing but a wasteland. So this led to all of the major factions signing the Ares Conventions, and what these basically were, were a series of documents that said, please, pretty please, stop nuking each other and try to limit your fighting to outside of cities and away from civilian populaces so that we don't have to keep rebuilding our factories, but more importantly, rebuilding all of the slaves, uh, workers that operate them. Thanks, that would be great. What this did was essentially normalize warfare. 
By instituting a number of rules that kept conflicts relatively cold, even at their height, and generally kept things simmering without bringing out the really big weapons, it incentivized all of the great houses to keep constant, ongoing, low-intensity wars with each other without the threat of nuclear annihilation. What held the Age of War back from truly being apocalyptic was that none of the great houses believed they could win. None of them actually thought they would be able to get past the quagmire of mutually assured destruction if they decided to really go for it, so it generally kept the wars on the periphery and kept the devastation there. Now though, with the way that wars were structured under the Ares Convention, it was much safer to commit a vast amount of military resources to fighting on dozens of different worlds at the same time, because you could be pretty well assured that nobody was going to reduce it to atoms if they started losing. So you could potentially get very good territorial gains if you could commit overwhelming forces. This was not a good sign, and is pretty much what led to the current state of Battletech, where everyone is fighting all the time. Also caused mercenaries to start kicking around, because war is good for business. Business is booming. Oh, business is absolutely booming. You know, I think, in my heart of hearts, the real reason that mercenary work started to really kick off now is because your average merc didn't need to be worried about someone in orbit going, oh well, I guess we lose, and then hitting the big red button and hitting reset on life. <laughs> there were, however, actually a few factions that chose not to sign the conventions because they didn't believe in them or they thought that they were hypocritical. And we're going to start with the one that was just, in my opinion, 500% correct, and that was the United Hindu Collective. They were a colony pretty far off, like a, like a little micronation of, you guessed it, Hindus. Kind of the definition of, of Gandhi with nukes, okay? Just stay off my lawn and we will not have any problems. We want nothing to do with you. Leave us alone. They were 100% correct, by the way, as time showed. The other faction that didn't sign these were the Torian Concordat. Have I explained them to you? No. You know what? I'm not going to bother going into it too much. I will summarize their okay. entire faction uh, in a single sentence. Loads shotgun with malicious intent. Hippity hoppity, get the fuck off my property. Okay. That is their entire faction and everything they live by. And the reason that they didn't sign the conventions was because while the conventions were being drawn up, while they were being ratified, and after they had been signed by the Capellan Confederation, because just the Capellans will never stop being the worst people imaginable, the Capellans were still committing nuclear atrocities and massacres on the same level of Tintavel on multiple Concordat worlds, and they were doing it intentionally to break their morale. So the Concordat went Absolutely not, you deceitful little shits. They did not sign, for very obvious reasons. If the Capellans are your neighbors, you probably shouldn't ever be willing to get rid of any weapon for any reason. You're probably going to need it. Now, this continued relatively uninterrupted, this state of being, until the Third Endurian War. A conflict over another planet, just like what happened with Tintabel, which is pretty impressive considering that the ban on nuclear weapons lasted mostly unbroken and untested for about 160 years. Like, that's, that's pretty good for telling people please don't blow each other up when that's pretty much the only thing any of them want to do. Now, <clears throat> the Third Endurian War was a tipping point for the history of the Inner Sphere. The first time the world was fought over, it was just a disaster. The second time, it was similarly a disaster without end. And remember how we talked about in the lore overview that the Free Worlds League and the Capellan Confederation keep fighting over the same like handful of worlds like a dozen times? They just, the, no progress is made. They just keep murdering each other for no reason. This is one of those worlds that they kept fighting over. When a new Capellan chairman rose to power, he tried to win the support and love of his people, which he absolutely did not have by backstabbing his way into power, by starting a war over old grudges and attempting to get that whole rally round the flag effect, by going after Endurian, for the third time. The conflict started bad and only escalated further, threatening to become like Tintavel before it. And the reason is because the Capellans immediately got their ass handed to them. They started a conflict, 
that they could not win, and they were almost immediately on the back foot from minute go, and just were right on the edge of resorting to war crimes. Here's where the saving grace really came in. Ian Cameron, the essentially high lord, basically, we'll, we'll go with that, of the Terran hegemony, stepped in to help negotiate leveraging their position by this point in time as a relatively neutral third party to help facilitate peace talks. Endurian was given to Liao without further fighting, and in exchange, Liao would renounce a number of territorial claims on uh, Free Worlds League territory and agree to support House Merrick and the Free Worlds League as a full member unchallenged when Terra decided to start forming the Star League. And believe it or not, this was actually the roots of the Star League. The three nations that got together to form what would become the Super Space UN were the Free Worlds League, an unbelievable dysfunctional democracy that can barely hold itself together, and the Terran hegemony, techno-fetishists that are the most advanced people in the galaxy and super paranoid about running out of resources, and the Capellans, the most backstabbiest, kidney-shanking people you've ever seen. Those were the three nations that put aside their differences and decided to form the Star League. Like, I can understand the Lyrians and the Federated Sons when they formed the Federated Commonwealth, you know? They tried to resurrect the Star League themselves. Fair enough, you know? Like, they kinda get along. They're not really the enemies, right? And they married in with right. each other. They, they did that whole wonderful noble thing of marrying to secure political alliances so cool fine i i can understand I mean, that. what other way to do that man i mean yeah i know how how do you become friends with your your mortal enemy well you get your son to bang his daughter and there you go congratulations you're friends now <laughs> how the fuck that <laughs> works <guys>. i have <laughs> only things could be solved like that in real life the world would be so much more peaceful <laughs> Oh my god. Anyways, yeah, those those three nations that you would never expect to get along for any reason began the incredibly long and arduous process of hashing out all of their political differences, and basically the only way that this happened and that the groundwork to unify those three states into one polity even began is because of Ian Cameron and the Terran hegemony, and we gotta cover them real quick because they are very significant. Terra had, you know, Earth has essentially been the heart of humanity one way or another throughout the entire history of Battletech. Its significance has almost never been in question, whether it be the Terran hegemony, whether it be the initial, like, human expansion out from the cradle, all the way to Comstar, the clans rushing for it, like, it's always been the very heart of humankind, and that is absolutely embodied by the Terran hegemony. They began conducting peace talks quite a while before this event, mediating negotiations with the other great houses and generally working as a political and military neutral party and almost as a guarantor. They began solving problems with, quite frankly, insane but ingenious solutions. They began splitting up worlds and giving what the different great houses and factions wanted to them while separating out what the other wanted and just carving up worlds. Sometimes it was an even 50-50 split between, for example, the Terran hegemony and the Lyrian Commonwealth. Other times it was maintaining control of a single continent with star bases above it and giving the rest of the world or even the rest of the star system over to another great house. And sometimes it was anything in between. They negotiated for partial control of multiple worlds rather than full control because the Terran hegemony was in an interesting predicament. They were boxed in on all sides. There was no room for them to further expand. There was no worlds that they could take and trying to expand through military force didn't work in the past and was most likely going to end very badly if all the other great houses decided or understood, I should say, that the only way that Terra can expand its influence is by decreasing theirs. So instead, they used economic uh, integration and political alliances to get control of the incredible industrial and economic hubs of these various worlds, while at the same time settling territorial disputes and building up goodwill with the different factions. This basically positioned the Terran hegemony, and Ian Cameron more directly, as the peacemaker, the group that is going to sit down and solve your problems for you. And they spent a long time carefully cultivating that appearance 
very specifically for what would come next. Strong-arming the entire Inner Sphere into the Star League. And strong-arming works because, like I mentioned, they were the most technologically advanced to an almost fetishistic degree, which Comstar would carry on well into the future. Because of all of this ridiculous military buildup and economic strength that they had, where they couldn't bribe or coerce or seduce their way into what they wanted, they could strong-arm or guarantee or offer that strength in the assistance of another great house. If someone started a conflict with another great house, they would enter the war on the side of the person who was attacked and basically guarantee a quick wipe of the attacker. And this brought a very swift end to a number of the smaller conflicts that were going on and allowed the Terran hegemony to negotiate even more of those wonderful little planet-splitting agreements between the other great houses to end their border disputes. Truly, this cannot come back to bite them in the ass by unilaterally solving problems and coming up with diplomatic solutions. That has never gone wrong anywhere, any when. Absolutely never. It's surely the equivalent of the, I'm from the United States government and I'm here to help. It doesn't have anything in this universe. Surely that doesn't exist. Even, even Americans shit a brick when they hear that. There's nothing to fear but FEMA itself, man. <laughs> oh, the, the, that's the. It doesn't matter who you are in the world. That is the scariest statement ever. I'm from the U.S. government. I'm here to help. Oh no. We hope we get an episode up next week. <laughs> oh my god. Anyways, though, with the Age of War coming to an end, the formation of the Star League began properly. Like I said, the Free Worlds League, the Capellans, and the um, Terran Hegemony joined together in relatively equal diplomatic unity. Now, I need to be very clear. The Star League was not unifying the different great houses into one superstate. It's more accurate to call them a federation. It's basically a number of independent uh, groups, nations, polities, whatever, that all come under one banner and begin pooling their resources for the greater good. Each of them was allowed to maintain their economic policies, their own law, their own government and military structure, as well as their own army. Hell, the great houses in the member states were even allowed to fight small-scale wars with one another, although they weren't allowed to escalate them and they weren't allowed to actually steal other people's worlds. If they were getting into a fight over trade disputes, for example, and nothing would solve it, yeah, sure, kids, go have a fist fight behind the garage and then come back a little bit later. But for the love of God, make sure one of you doesn't mug the other, and if you break a nose, ooh, we're gonna be having problems tonight. And that was basically how they treated conflicts. Basically the UN. <laughs> Pretty much, yeah. None of the great houses could ever go to war with one another. No massive conflict could ever destabilize humanity and the inner sphere in general. Everything was supposed to be kept stable by the Star League, which makes it all the more hilarious that the very first thing they did was launch a literal crusade in every single direction at the same time against everyone who didn't join. I see no issue with such things. <laughs> oh my god, the literal definition of doublethink, man. It's fantastic. But like I mentioned, the first three factions that joined ended up doing so fairly smoothly and with very little struggle or strife. However, that was not to be the case with the other three great houses. Now, you would think that in all honesty, if you saw three of the six great powers joining together in a unity or alliance, the other three should probably pull together as well because, you know, a super state was just formed and it's probably going to roll you over because that's what happened pretty much every other time in human history when something like this happened. So surely, surely they, they form into one, right? Surely. No. That's not what they do. In fact, things get much worse for them very quickly. I wonder why. <laughs> because of all of the politicking of the Terran hegemony, a lot of the quote-unquote diplomatic relations they had were kinda solved, but they also still all hated each other. They didn't get rid of any of the underlying distrust or resentment that had built up between the Great Houses, so none of them really wanted to work together, like, at all. The first faction outside of the initial three that actually joined was the Lyrians, and they were brought in because they were suffering an enormous economic meltdown. They were losing Scrooge McDuck-esque levels of money, and the Star League and- I don't and... think I've 
ever heard anyone describe anything as Scrooge McDuck levels of money. Have you not seen the Scrooge McDuck money vault? The giant... I, I have. But yeah. I've just never heard someone say it like that. It's, that's it. He's got like a gazillion dollars. Like, how would you want me to describe it? Bezos-esque levels of money? That doesn't roll off the yes. tongue as much. <laughs> okay. Make sure you throw a picture of the money vault for those yeah, okay. uh, uninitiated. All right. I'll, I'll throw I'll throw some I'll throw a picture of the money vault up in there. Join the Patreon. <laughs> we, <laughs> the Patreon that's not set up yet. Yeah, sure. Join it anyway. Send us money. <laughs> Direct transfer me money. Give me all of your money. Your life savings now. Put them in the bag. <laughs> I'll comment one of my uh my money transfer apps. Someone send me something. <laughs> <laughs> so the absolute Please, mad okay. lad so the absolute desperate mad lad actually posts his frickin' PayPal information in the comments below. Getting getting back on topic though, so the Lyrian Commonwealth was suffering pretty bad. However, what the Star League offered was essentially a free market. All of that incredible industrial potential that the Lyrians had that was currently languishing, all of the instability that was going on, the lack of jobs, the political and social unrest that was happening, all of it would basically disappear because suddenly the Lyrians would have access to three other great houses worth of economic space, all of that industrial demand, and massive amounts of raw resources that the Terran hegemony desperately needed and the other great houses would also really want. So, it would put their factories back to work, it would drastically improve their economy, and it would bring a huge amount of stability back to the uh, Lyrian Commonwealth. And so, they decided to join, becoming the fourth nation to be part of the Star League. Moving on from the Lyrians though, the next one to join was the Federated Sons, and they were similarly in a terrible position. The Federated Sons had just come down off of a brutal civil war that had left them extremely weakened, very politically divided, and extraordinarily vulnerable to territorial claims. The Draconis Combine and the Capellan Confederation, because the, Pel the Capellans can just never stop being the worst people ever, were trying to regain control of territory that they had lost in the years, decades, centuries prior, and the Capellans were using their newfound alliance with the Star League to very heavily strong arm the uh, Federated Sons, while the Draconis Combine had basically hired a pirate and mercenary army to harass dozens of worlds on their border. So the Federated Sons was in a very weak position. However, the leader of the Federated Sons did not want to join the Star League. He generally saw the offer for what it was, the Star League coming in at a moment of incredible weakness, offering to take away all of their troubles in exchange for essentially turning the Federated Sons into a subservient member that would basically be forced to kowtow. With such a weak position, there was no way that the Fed Sons could exert their influence in a council of the other great houses, and they would most likely become a political puppet, or more likely politically dependent on one of the other factions. Probably the Terran hegemony, because they're crafty like that. You can kind of see where Comstar's scheming came from, can't you? Eh, just a little bit, yeah. So what ended up happening was the Terran hegemony made a deal with the Federated Sons. In exchange, for a whole bunch of technology, like just an insane amount of it, as well as a absolute buttload of spaceships protecting their, well, space, they would join. And they decided, you know what, this deal is pretty good. But what really capped it off was that the Terran hegemony agreed that if any of the other great houses tried to make territorial claims or tried to force any conflict on the Federated Sons in their weakened states, then the Terran hegemony and the nascent Star League Defense Force would come in like the cavalry and absolutely body them. This was less against the Capellans because they were firmly whipped into line at this point. Stop messing with your neighbors, Capella. I see you down there. Stop being a terrible little slice of the pie. And it was more directed at the Draconis Combine, because they were still the last holdout, they were extremely militaristic, and most importantly, politically, joining the Star League was almost untenable. It was extremely unpopular and was highly likely to go over very badly. 
simply wasn't politically viable for them. There wasn't really the willpower there, and they couldn't really sell it to their people, even though joining wasn't a bad thing, because the Draconis Combine, as you know from our brief lore primer, is very poor. They have very, very little natural resources, and what they do have is clustered very heavily on a few very important worlds. So having access to the Free Worlds League economy and all of the money of the Federated Sons, as well as the insane industrial output and raw resources of uh, Steiner and the Lyrian Commonwealth, that would have been great for the Draconis Combine. But since they couldn't actually make that work with the current climate, the Terran hegemony did their thing again, and with a mixture of bribery, propaganda, as well as many, many threats, and the not-so-subtle insinuation that, hey, you know, man, Draconis Combine, guys, I know you're proud, I know you're strong, but the other five members, the other five great houses, we're all here, buddy. A, a fight between us really doesn't look good. All the while, every single time they nudged the poor Draconis Combine, they were raising the pistol a little higher. <laughs> it's, it started pointed at their feet, and they were lifting it a little closer to their head every time. As the, as the future crusade shows, Ian Cameron and the Terran hegemony, they really wanted this to work diplomatically, but they were not afraid of pulling out the stick. So eventually, the Draconis Combine finally gave in. They didn't really collapse, they just negotiated out some more favorable terms so that when they sold this agreement to their people, it could come off more like the Draconis Combine's strength getting concessions out of the Star League. They had to look strong. That was the entirety of all of the Great Houses coming together to form the Star League. This was it. All of the leaders met on Terra, and this is when everything, for lack of a better term politically, kinda hit the fan. You see, the Great House leaders didn't really tell anyone else what they were doing. You see, House Cameron had basically total dictatorial control of the Terran hegemony. The Terran hegemony was House Cameron. It was this hereditary dictatorship. So what they said goes. They controlled everything. So for them, doing something this ground-shaking, this absolutely ridiculous, not a big deal. They say jump, the entire hegemony says how high. But for the others, they were having a problem. Especially the Free Worlds League, because when um, the head of House Merrick came back and was like, Hey guys! Guess what? We're unifying with all the other great houses. Being a democracy, they immediately wanted to civil war. Because of course they did. <laughs> of course. Of course they did. The Lyrian Commonwealth's, uh, like, council, they really did not like this. The higher-ups and the nobles and the warlords of the Draconis Combine did not like this. The noble houses and duchies and the different, uh, like... I guess, sub-states with Federated Sons, did not like this. Nobody cares about the Capellans because they're irrelevant. And just this was absolute political turmoil. Because what they did was they went to Terra, and everyone had thought that these were basically just ceasefires, right? Everyone thought that they were ratifying, like, the Ares Conventions Mark II, and it was just to make sure that, you know, the, the Age of War never came back, that they were going to civilize conflict a little more, right? And then, they dropped the bomb that goes, um, actually, no, guys, we're one super state now. And then they all held hands, elected Ian Cameron as the first star... First star what? I, 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 was, gonna call, yeah. I, was, gonna, I was gonna call him the first star lord, but no. The first lord of the Star League. First amongst equals, and the primogenitor of this massive new empire, with all of the other heads of the great houses acting as council members, extremely powerful, but ultimately subservient to a form of feudal democracy with the king at the top. The reactions ranged from absolute outrage at people who thought that their states were being subsumed by something else, the hypernationalists frothing at the mouth because of this declaration, to people being ecstatic, it's finally seeing an end to the conflict, putting all of the war behind us, and is humanity moving forward as a unified force for the first time in pretty much ever. So there was a wide and drastic difference in opinion on the actual formation of the Star League. However, remember, just because the names of these factions might be the Draconis Combine or the Lyrian Commonwealth or whatever, everybody knows that the single noble family that controls it are the people really in power. So when they said this is happening, all of the smaller powers and stuff and all of the different people that were not happy about it, they kicked, they screamed, whatever, 
but they couldn't really do anything about it. And so the Star League came into being. And the very first thing that they did was Ian Cameron appointed his wife as the director general of the Star League Defense Force and began building up the greatest military humanity had ever seen. By this point, the Star League Defense Force was in its early nascent years. It wasn't really much more powerful than a regular Great House military force. But because all of the Great Houses were willingly, I might add, contributing huge amounts of manpower and material, it rapidly ballooned in size to become easily powerful enough to outright stomp on any of the Great Houses. Like, it wouldn't even be a fight with how big the Star League Defense Force was getting. Who could have foreseen such things occurring? Oh no. Oh no. Taking a whole bunch of each of the militaries of the Great Houses and combining them into my own personal army led by my wife. Who could have ever seen this happening? This is- I'm gonna- I'm gonna pause for a second because this is one of those things that I'm- I'm sitting here and I'm like, how the fuck did this glorious bastard get away with this? Ian Great. Cameron- Ian Cameron ended so many conflicts basically by his own chutzpah and charisma. He used his empire to strong arm a whole bunch of others into falling in line. This man built the Star League. He committed the ultimate act of nepotism and appointed his wife as the commander in general of the biggest military of all time. <laughs> and he basically took over all of humanity by himself by smiling real nice into the cameras and asking please. <laughs> Apparently, all you need to build the biggest empire ever was to just ask nicely. Who would have guessed? Ian Cameron, the greatest statesman to ever exist as far as I'm concerned. It's insane what this man managed to accomplish. And in order to kind of get past the fact that hypernationalism was still a really big problem in the Star League, they used Terran hegemony units exclusively as the command and leadership elements of the Star League Defense Force to maintain that they had absolute control over the SLDF. And for all of the house militaries and the resources they got from them, they basically forced them to undergo retraining, sending them all back to boot camp in the way that House Cameron and Terran Hegemony trains their soldiers. Then they scattered them to the different great houses. So soldiers and mech warriors from the Lyrian Commonwealth would be stationed in Federated Sun space, or in Capellan space, far, far away from their own territory. And that heralds the beginning of the Star League, the beginning of the Star League Defense Force, and how the Terran Hegemony and Ian Cameron and, you know, the Council of Lords managed to gain absolute control over the Inner Sphere. And what they did next was send a number of envoys to all of the periphery realms, the Rimworld's Republic, the Magistry of Canopus, the Torian Concordat, who promptly told them to hippity-hoppity get the fuck off my property once again, because they were having absolutely none of that, and the Outworld's Alliance, I believe, the really big periphery nations that were the last holdouts of, for lack of a better term, free humanity out from under the tyranny of the Star League. And thus, the Star League decided this shall not stand when every single one of them politely or not so politely declined, guess it's time for a crusade, and began gathering all of the house militaries alongside the Star League Defense Force and preparing for arguably the greatest war humanity had ever seen until the succession wars would come with the fall of the Star League. Yeah, and that's pretty much it. Thanks to all the people that made it this far, the support is greatly appreciated. We are growing ridiculously fast. We're already at like 1,200 subscribers. We're already a quarter of the way to 2,000. We're making insane progress, and the Patreon is well on its way. I have two tiers set up. I'm thinking of making a third tier. Got some rewards already, uh, already laid out for it, so things are going well. Anything to add, Steve-O? Just want to thank all y'all again for uh, tuning in to us, mainly Canadian, <laughs> rambling, and uh, my occasional color commentary. <laughs> occasional little color commentary, the odd nugget of, of wisdom or humor here and there. I try my best to mix it up. In... Not everyone just wants to hear you ramble on for an hour. Oh, everyone who watches these videos are turbo nerds. They would show... If I was discussing nothing but logistics and transportation, people would still tune in for, like, a two-hour sermon. Man, it's just insulted half the community. It's fine. <laughs>
If you want to check out my main channel where I do video games and stuff, check out The Raging Canadian. It's the first link in the description of the video. And if you want to check out when I'm live streaming, Wednesday, Thursday, and Saturday, probably about midday or in the afternoon, there's abouts, check out my Twitch link, the one immediately below that. I hope you'll enjoy some of the other content I make. I thank you very much for enjoying this if you've made it this far. Have a wonderful day, goodbye, and we will see you for part two next week. I don't know, whenever we get around to uploading it. Soon, TM. Soon, trademark. <laughs> the science insanity soon. <laughs> <laughs>